Hi friends, welcome. Today I want to talk about Jordan Hammond. He is a well-rounded travel photographer. I am wildly impressed with his photos. He has a polished and uh, finesse-filled style that I quite enjoy. He's rather prolific. Every photo he takes feels very well thought out. So, let's talk about Jordan Hammond. I'll link below to his things. Okay. The first photo I want to take a look at today was taken in Manarola, I believe. I've actually never heard of this place, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. We have a beautiful collage of colorful buildings stacked on top of one another. Uh, the, the buildings are incredibly, exceptionally colorful. It seems like a really interesting place to live. It looks as if these buildings are in a harbor. It's a very lean composition. The buildings fill the frame. There's a lot of compression which is, probably has a lot to do with a longer focal length. We have beautiful edges. If you've been around this channel for some time, you know that I love my edges. And um, in this case, we don't have anything poking in in strange ways or anything significant. Like it, on the right-hand side, there's like a little diagonal pole thing popping in. But overall, it looks like the edges were meticulously looked over before sharing, and I love that. Uh, it gives a certain level of polish. You're going to hear me say polish a lot. I apologize. Uh, there is a lot of compression, like I mentioned. Now, he could have used a wider angle lens, and if he was standing in the place where he was standing when he took this photo, he would introduce a lot more stuff into the frame. Uh, things that may make it feel a bit less organized. Things that would definitely make it feel different than this. Uh, thing, things that may make this photo not be as fit for like a travel magazine as it is in this case uh, because this is very very beautifully done in in that respect obviously if you wanted to use a wider focal length you could create a photo that's equally as beautiful in a different way but this one is very specifically beautiful in a very specific way there is a lot of um, complexity in this frame he, he was able to organize everything that's going on quite well, all of the colors. It's, it's the complete opposite, the antithesis of a minimalistic color palette here, which is hard to do. Um, so respect, Mr. Jordan. But there are also a lot of patterns which help out. There are a lot of rectangles, specifically, specifically in the windows and with the buildings themselves. Um, there is a lot of depth as well even though these buildings feel like they're stacked on top of each other there's a lot of separation between everything and this probably has some to do with light uh, probably has some to do with the fact that the buildings even though they are uh, even though they are on top of each other you can feel the difference between them and because he made the framing so lean he didn't include too much extraneous stuff. There is a feeling that everything kind of aligns together. It's, it's got like a Tetris kind of vibe to it. So complexity demands depth. Because if you have complexity without depth, you just have chaos, which is what a lot of times we're trying to avoid in a photo. Uh, organized chaos, great thing. Chaotic chaos, generally not a great thing. One of the things he does is he will include narratives with his photos on Instagram. And a lot of people do this, but I'm, I'm just interested in the way he does it because a lot of times his narratives have a bit more to do with maybe what he's doing that day or where he's going next than the photo itself and what's happening in the photo. This is a good way to uh, not so much create context for where he is, but have a personal connection with him the photographer so for example underneath this one what we read is how many windows can you count question mark just a few hours ago at sophia pope and i found out we are flying back to europe tomorrow dot 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 mm, suspense any guesses where question mark he didn't capitalize any Foul. Anyway, comma, I best go and start packing, exclamation point. And we have an emoji of a house with a tree behind it and an emoji of the thing that you hold in your hand when you're painting that holds your paint. Very exciting stuff. So you're able to have a relational connection with Jordan here because of this. It's not just uh, the location and the photo. 
even though that would be perfectly fine. He added an extra dimension, which I think is quite nice. In the next photo, we have a train going down a track into a rolling field of, of green grass and trees in Sri Lanka. We have a girl, the subject of the photo, unarguably because of her vibrant red hair, leaning out of the window. She has her elbows rested on the window seal. She makes herself known by... She would make herself known if she had brown hair, but she makes herself abundantly known because of the red hair contrasted against the blue train. Colors mean different things in accordance to what they're contrasted against. And in this case, the beautiful red or you know orangish color of hair against the blue uh, makes her pop off. So the color palette is quite interesting in this photo. It's it's minimalistic. It's minimalistic, really. Uh, there's there's blue on the train. There's blue in the sky. There's the the warm colors of her skin and her hair, and then there's green grass. So we see blue, red, green. So the photo feels incredibly organized because of this. We're riding on the train with the girl, and we're hanging off the the train. So we're on the outside. So. Uh, Fantastic work on his part, working hard for an angle. Uh, I, I, maybe he's hanging out of his own window. Maybe he went into the middle of two train cars. But he looks like he's way out there. Looks like he extended his arm quite far from the train to take the photo. So it looks like he worked for it. One thing that's really that really makes this photo come alive is the leading lines. There are quite a few. We have a path that's running down beside the train track, a dirt path, only big enough for someone to perhaps walk on. And then we have the train itself acting as a leading line. The train is starting near us. It runs all the way up and down the, the left side of the frame and then shoots into the distance. So we get this feeling that we're going somewhere. And also, if you look in the distance, there is a break in the hill where I assume the train would go through. So this helps our mind, gives our mind some, some food to create a narrative, different context points. But anyway, back to leading lines. The train itself is acting as a giant leading line. And then on top of the train, there's a, a little ridge where the roof is that acts as a, a small leading line itself. I like the rounded windows in this photo. It makes it, the photo feel a bit more gentle and happy than if the windows were stark. The, you know, they had stark corners. Obviously, the photographer couldn't control that, but he captured it well here. Um, one thing that is interesting is if we overlaid the rule of thirds onto this photo, her head lands right at the convergence point between the bottom horizontal line and the left vertical line. And if you're ever getting a little bit confused about where to put a head in a frame, and you know, use the rule of thirds and you can move yourself around that box, that square, and you can find interesting places that make your photo come alive a little bit more. Next we have another photo taken in Sri Lanka. We have this beautiful island in the sky type of formation. Uh, below we have a jungle, a sea of jungle, and then we have this big oval egg-shaped rock formation shooting up with some sort of ancient city, town type of environment happening on top. It's a beautiful area. It looks like it's a rather spectacular place to fly over in a helicopter. One thing I noticed about this photo is that the colors on top of the hill are slightly brighter and more saturated than the colors on the bottom. So the greens are more gr punchy green, the, the, uh, b the rocks and building materials that they created, the, um, what buildings were made out of, they are a sort of an orangish color and they're quite bright. So it contrasts itself well against everything else in the frame and helps create more of a hierarchy. I wonder if this was done in editing. I wonder, or I wonder how much of this was done in editing. I wonder how much of this was created just because of the light. Could be a mixture of both, but well done for sure. Uh, the greens are beautiful all through the frame. The light 
in the scene, and the angle accentuates the enormity of this rock formation and what we're seeing here. There is a play between the rounded and rectangular shapes in the shot, too. The roundedness being the entire island in the sky rock formation, and the rectangular shapes being the the ruins of the city itself. Very small city. I guess it would be a town or a village, but um, would be an interesting place to live. Like, holy crap. The other thing he did here, which I thought was interesting, was he included a video. I like this because I'm always talking about adding more context to the story you're telling. Well, one way to do that is to have your first, on Instagram, have your first block be a photo. And that's that's your banger photo, right? That's what makes everybody click on it. And then the second one is a video. So, you know, in this case, it was a, it was a drone flyover of the scene or helicopter flyover of the scene, one of the two. And um, this is a good way to, you know, immerse yourself or immerse your viewers into the story a bit more in a different way than you would if not. Next, we have a just a ridiculous, glorious orchestration of a photo taken in China. We have these, uh, we have a flat field with mountains shooting up in the middle of it. The mountains are broken up in a very interesting way, not in the way that you would normally see mountains. A lot of times, mountain like you'll have a lot of flat land, and then you'll have a bunch of mountains all clustered together, and then more flat land. In this case, we have some mountains that look like pyramids. And in fact, I've been learning a lot about pyramids. These might be man-made structures with trees grown on them at this point, but I don't know. I haven't studied that. But I think there are a, par- a lot of pyramids in China. So, wow, perhaps. Uh, but they're they're laid out like the pyramids are laid out in Giza. There's some nice separation between them. They make perfect triangles. There's a play between the triangles and a, a circle. The circle being the um, hot air balloon in the photo that is floating right next to the mountains with beautiful separation. It's on top of another mountain in the background, but that other mountain is very hazy. So there's this nice separation between the balloon from the mountains in the background and also the mountains in the foreground. Glorious orchestration, like I mentioned. Uh, Also, rectangles are in play here because we have some, what looks like some farm fields, uh, put together in different rectangular shapes. So we have a lot of different geometry happening here, and it plays together beautifully. Uh, If we look at the rule of thirds, once again, we have the hot air balloon being placed on the convergence point between the top horizontal line and the left vertical line. But also, if we look at the rule of odds, which is this idea of if you... um, if you want to make a more pleasing photo, it's a good idea to have an odd number of things in the photo other than an even number. So, for example, three instead of two is the the most prominent one that tends to happen in photography. Well, we have three mountains back to back as opposed to two. I think we would probably both agree here, me and you, all of you, that if it was just two mountains in the shot, this would probably be a much less interesting photo. There's a beautiful atmosphere uh, here with light and haze interplaying with one another probably taken early in the morning I would guess but there uh, another thing that that really makes this photo come alive is the implied human element the balloon itself which implies that there's someone flying that balloon and there's also some smoke coming up from a little point on the ground which tells you there's some human people down there so this is good because it helps us understand the scale of what we're looking at but also uh, as in the uh, our relationship between humans, and it's, uh, you know, we're connected with that. So, moving on, we have another photo taken in Japan. Now, we see here a technique that he starts to use, or that he tends to use in his photos frequently, which I quite love. I'll, I'll get to it in just a second. But we have uh, a building. I believe it's probably a temple building, although I didn't, I, I don't want to assume but it's a temple-esque building in Japan. Red, beautiful red color on the outside, orangish red. Uh, We have some semi-bluish, greenish roof top elements, or, well, roofs. (laughs) And then we have, in the background and all around, we have green mm, forest landscape. 
And then in the foreground, very close to us, right up on us, we have some pink flowers. And they act as a subframing element. They go all the way around the frame. They're completely out of focus. So if we look at this photo, we're seeing a well-established hierarchy. And he, he did this in shooting, and he probably did this in editing as well. And shooting, the way that he did this in shooting is he, of course, focused in on the thing that was the brightest point in the frame and then organized everything else around that and maybe moved his angle around to try to get everything to be organized in a very specific way. But in editing, uh, he likes to use vignettes, for example. This is a good way to help establish hierarchy because then you're able to, with a soft vignette, focus in on a subject in the, the shot that you want to focus in on and take some of the focus off the other elements that are flying around. So in this case, the flowers don't compete so much with the building. There's a soft division between elements here, which I, which I love. Um, and the layering, the layering creates an awareness of space and placement with the flowers in the foreground close to us, we know that we are standing next to a tree with flowers on it, on some sort of ridge somewhere, and we're looking into the distance and seeing that, the, so if this element was not here, we would just kind of be floating in space somewhere looking at this beautiful building. Now, there's also a waterfall in this photo, which plays nicely with the building in terms of balancing out the photo because the building feels a bit to the left in the shot. The waterfall is a bit to the right. So both of those things side by side helps the photo have a melodic balance to it, which I love. So we see a lot of different elements that he was able to put together to make the photo more interesting than if those elements were not there or if one was, you know, if the waterfall was behind the building, or if we didn't have these beautiful flowers. But what I was going to say is that these beautiful flowers going around the outside of the frame is something he tends to do a lot, whether with flowers or with uh, other elements like that. But in this next photo, they are, in fact, those same flowers. I believe it's cherry blossom trees that we're seeing here. This next photo was taken in Kyoto, Japan. We have a train coming down a track towards us. Purple train. Lovely purple color. I wish we had purple trains in America. Uh, our trains in America are boring. They're just generally like white and, and maybe red and like colors that make people not get hit by the train, but they want, they went for some aesthetically pleasing trains in Japan, I see. But once again, we have these flowers surrounding the outside of the frame. Uh, it's hard to work with tree limbs in photography, I've learned, so I'm actually rather impressed with how he was able to do this and not make the photo feel too cluttered and also not make the tree limbs feel uninteresting because that's easy to do. Now, I think one of the things that makes this work is the fact that there are pink flowers on the tree limbs. If you just have like a dead tree in, in South Carolina, <laughs> it's, not, it's not going to be as interesting as this. Uh, but, but yeah, tree limbs in my, in my experience are notori notoriously hard to work into a frame. But a lot of people do it quite well. Uh, we have a human element here. We have the driver in the train. That's a little touch that I really enjoy. And uh, one, one thing that he did here is he leaned up the composition by flipping it horizontal. I mean, I'm sorry, vertical. So that's one ha part of it. By flipping it vertical, he was able to get rid of extraneous stuff on the outside of the frame. The other half is he, he looks like he's in an area that is maybe more of a neighborhood and doesn't, like, there's a light pole here with power lines on top of it, which if uh, which tells me that there are a lot of other elements like that that might not be as interesting that you would want to get out of the frame. And so you probably cut out a lot here. And when you're trying to focus a photo, a lot of times it has much more to do with what you cut out of the frame than what you leave in the frame. So this is, this is really thoughtfully done. The next photo, taken of Mount Fuji. But we're in a town. So we have giant Mount Fuji in the background. In the foreground, we have a cityscape. We're standing on a road, looking down the road, the road acting as a bit of a, a leading line. We have some very soft highlights on the top of Mount Fuji, which I really love. 
uh, some probably has a lot to do with his editing. We have a lot of compression once again. He seems to shoot with longer focal lengths a lot, which I really enjoy. I think that it helps define his style. He looks like he's standing right in the middle of the road, shooting up the road, and the road looks like it goes to Mount Fuji, which is quite pleasing. So the compression here adds a lot of strength to the photo, I think, because it allows the mountain to feel like it's right on top of the town, as opposed to if you were to shoot with a wide angle. The mountain, the wider you go, the the less remarkable the mountain would be. Uh, if we look at the thirds, one thing that I really enjoy is that the on the bottom third of the frame we have the motorcyclist. Oh, there is a motorcyclist, by the way. Sorry for audio listeners. I forgot to mention that. There are some cars going up and down the road, and there happens to be a motorcyclist, which acts as one of the two, ah, two subjects in this photo. The motorcyclist on the bottom of the frame is the same distance away from the bottom of the frame that the top of the mountain is from the top of the frame. So this helps balance the photo out. I think it's very cleverly done, whether intentional or not. I assume it was somewhat intentional though. Uh, so I, like I was saying with the compression and our perspective, this triggers a sense of scale. This triggers a feeling of, holy crap, this mountain is enormous, which of course you would feel that there, but it's hard to capture that in a photo. So him zooming in real tight, putting the mountain, making the mountain feel like it's it's going to eat the city alive. And uh, as well as our perspective, I'm trying to think of, so there's probably another element of this that I'm missing that is really important. Perspective triggers. Oh yeah, uh, all of the city elements in the foreground, that allows us to really have a, a, a deep understanding of what we're looking at and feel the scene in a way that we wouldn't if it was not taken so thoughtfully. There's a lot of repetition in this photo too, which is good because there's a lot of complexity. So uh, the, the repetition helps a photo like this because you have lamp. Uh, these interesting lamp lantern type of things hanging from from poles shooting down the road very lovely <clears throat> and the subject is also set apart from everything else in the scene one of the subjects because i mentioned there were two right both subjects are set apart but the mount fuji is set apart just because it's freaking huge uh but the the motorcyclist is set apart because of a couple of things. One thing being the fact that there is nothing clashing with the motorcyclist like behind it. There's no car right behind it. Uh, this photo would have sort of broken a little bit if there were a lot of cars behind the motorcycle, perhaps. But also, the motorcyclist is in a little pocket of light. There's shadows all around him on the road, and he just happens to be in a specific point where he's quite lit up and he makes himself known in the shot. Next, we have a photo taken in New Delhi. This is a textbook composition of a photo. It's rather glorious. It's just too good. Uh, we have a boat sitting, well, we have a, I'll explain the photo before I get into the details of it. We have a boat sitting in some water, perhaps a lake. Beautiful evening or morning light, rather warm light, a little, little bit yellowish, orangish. Uh, but but quite blown out, quite white feeling as well. And then we have silhouetted birds, like hundreds of them, all around, flapping their wings and flying, all cattywampus, a glorious uh, menagerie of <laughs> of wings and bird bodies. And then we have someone sitting in a rowboat, which I, you don't see a lot these days, pretty cool, sitting in a rowboat, and he's rowing, beautiful expression. So, one of the things that I enjoy about this photo is that the boat is once again at a convergence point of, uh, if we look at the rule of thirds, where it's on the bottom vertical, the, the I'm sorry, the bottom horizontal line, the convergence point between that and the vertical line on the right. So, I'm trying to pay more attention to these things because 
this is a good way to to make your photos feel more organized and you should always be paying attention even though like when I go out I'm not thinking about overlaying the rule of thirds onto what I'm shooting on a daily basis but I should I should do that a bit more because it's a very good guideline I've been trying to do that a bit more the good thing and I don't like this because it feels like it gets in the way, but most cameras, you can overlay a grid, a rule of thirds grid, and put things in the frame where you want them to be. Um, but for me, it, I think it just comes down to me being more thoughtful about it. Maybe that's the same for you. But uh, he, anyway, he lands at that convergence point in a wonderful way. His expression is interesting because he seems to almost be mirroring the birds because he's in mid-row, so the, the uh, rows? What are they called? The boat rowers. The rowing utensils are acting almost as wings in the composition. It's it's very interesting. A lot of the birds are in mid-flap, but a lot of the birds are not. But there's enough of them in mid-flap that it really makes the photo work. Because if, you, if all of the birds were just kind of like flying darts <laughs> in the air with no wings on them or the wings were in a weird place that looks like the wings are broken it would not be as interesting of a photo it's very hard to take photos of birds I don't think I've ever taken a successful photo of a bird so I always appreciate when people pull that off well there's a lot of nonsense in this frame uh, there, there are tons of birds they're not in a beautiful grid <laughs> they're all over the place but it's organized by hierarchy uh, we and this hierarchy is made up of a strong subject, a very sharp contrast. All the birds and and the person in the boat is a silhouette. We're shooting into the light, and also there's a rather simple color palette. There's not a lot of competition in terms of colors. In the next photo, taken in Tokyo, Japan, we have a store owner in a. Uh, how, how would I explain this? He is sitting in a shop with thousands of things around him. I don't know exactly what he's selling, but they like colorful, maybe little beads or things of this sort, electronics on top as well. Hard to tell, but lots of colors. Uh, it's, it's a crazy storefront, especially if you live in a place like America where things are much they have much less character. Storefronts have a lot less character to them. It's quite wonderful. He's very far away from us. So this is a potential hierarchy problem. Uh, and there's there's stuff everywhere. So that's also a potential hierarchy problem. So the combination of him being very far away from us and having so many things in the frame could create serious issues. Um, the way that I see that Jordan was able to fix these hierarchy problems here was, one, he used a vignette. It's a rather strong vignette, but it's not too heavy-handed. It feels quite nice here. If this vignette was not there, the um, all of the stuff on the edges would fight for the attention a bit more. Also, the subject is bright enough. And I think this is interesting. I'm not exactly sure how he did this because the lighting is not... It's quite flat. I mean, there's, nothing, there's no beam of light hitting his face in a particularly special way, but... It's shot and edited to where the subject is bright enough that he separates himself from everything else in the frame in a beautiful way. Also, his face, he has a lovely smile on his face. He looks like a man with a lot of character. These beautiful round glass, round? Round glasses. And so this guy's character helps him jump off the photo, makes it more exciting. A distinct, vibrant expression. Also, even though this scene feels quite chaotic, the display is actually rather organized. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff, but it's beautifully organized in a way that, that has a lot of character to it. So it's, it's a really wonderful photo, lovely environmental portrait. In the next one taken in India, we have a woman walking down some stairs. Now, she appears to be walking down a wall of different stairs going different directions in an organized pattern. It's a very bizarre looking landscape. Lots of titillating patterns going on here. And a titillating angle as well. We're looking at the scene from a higher up angle tilted down onto the person. 
Uh, we have a nearly perfect balance in this photo. The woman sets it off a little bit because she's coming in from the left side. She's not perfectly in the center, but I actually really like that here. It's quite nice. Also, she's carrying something on her head, so she's wearing a blue dress. She has uh, she's carrying sort of a a bowl on her head or some sort of so something you know with something in it. Obviously, there's probably a reason why she's carrying it, not just for fun. Uh, <laughs> There, there are some pleasing imperfections, which I really enjoy in this photo, with the wall being rather worn. This looks like a, an old wall, very tannish, uh, yellowish color, with, with some rain erosion going down the side of it, perhaps. So the, the, the wear represents a little bit of wabi-sabi, which I've spoken about a lot. Um, and there's an implied narrative, right, where she's going down a, one of these sets of steps in this grid of steps. You're thinking, okay, she came from that first one, went to the next one, then went to the next one. She zigzagged her way down. She's zigzagging her way. That's the best way to actually explain. I was trying to figure out how to explain what the pattern of these stairs are. Uh, it's a zigzag formation. It's a, pattern, it's, a, it's a patterned zigzag formation. So she's zigzagging her way down. So we have this implied narrative of where she came from and where she's going. We have another one taken at the Taj Mahal. And I've seen plenty of photos of the Taj Mahal, but this is probably might be the most interesting one I've ever seen or one of for sure. Because it's a different, it's a bit of a different angle. It's a bit of a different take. So I'll get into that as I go. Uh, we have a woman standing on the platform that the Taj Mahal is built on, which is interesting because the platform is actually, seems to be like a couple stories off the ground that it's built on. And one of the things I love about this photo is I've never seen the platform that it's built on before. I always thought it was sort of at ground level. In this case, there's quite a drop off to some grasslands on the left side of the frame. But anyway, I'll explain the photo now. There's a woman standing with a red dress she has her arms as if she's about to pull the hood of the dress down or pull it up one of the two or she's just finishing pulling it up so interesting expression quite intriguing she is standing next to the railing looking out away from the Taj Mahal into the distance looking towards the left side of the frame and she's quite separated from everybody else in the frame and the, the building itself so there is a subject separation, which is important here. If this was a very busy day and there were people all around her, this photo would lose a lot of strength. She's alone. We're alone with her. Uh, she, she hangs out at one of the convergence points again, if we look at the rule of thirds. Right vertical, um, bottom horizontal. And the photo is backlit for a sort of dreamy quality. Uh, shooting through the from the the back side of the building and the towers there's an exciting depth here i really enjoy it uh we're sh looking at the building from an angle we're not straight on as a lot of people would try to take a photo of it from so this is a new perspective of something i've seen many many times and this new perspective caught my eye whereas most don't really <laughs> In the next one, taken in Malaysia, we have what looks like an enormous outdoor staircase. Very colorful, these steps. They are painted in blocks of color. And on the left-hand side, we have blocks of colors that match these steps on the right-hand side. And then in the middle, we have two sets of stairs that are also blocks of colors. Looks more like a gradient than a solid color that mirror each other. So the ones on the outside are the same, the ones in the middle are the same. So we have patterns happening here. Another pattern that's happening is with the subject in the frame. There's a subject. There's a person making his way down the stairs. He's wearing a shirt that is white on the bottom and blue on the top, and it breaks at just the same time that the steps break into another color block. It's very clever the way that he framed this up. The white on the guy's shirt actually mirrors the white behind him. And then on the top half of his shirt, there's blue, which mirrors blue on the next set of steps. I hope that makes sense. It's, it's beautifully done. 
the steps have character rich imperfections. They look like they've been around for a while. One thing I enjoy about this photo as well is that the steps on the very bottom are perfectly level. They're not like one staircase is not coming in at a different point than the other staircase in terms of its relationship to the edge of the frame. Uh, whenever I'm taking photos of steps, I try to make them level and I try to make them have a, an appropriate distance between the bottom of the frame. He did that well here. Uh, okay. <clears throat> we have another one taken in Petra, which is an ancient city in southern Jordan. And a lot of these buildings were carved into the mountains. Uh, very beautiful structures. In this case, we're looking at it from up high at sort of a, a diagonal angle to one of those structures. We have a human element. We have a person riding what looks like perhaps a, is a donkey. He's quite small. The structure is quite big, scale. So this provides a sense of scale, humanity. Uh, you get the feeling that the person is passing by, so we have an implied narrative. And the person is also cleverly aligned with the giant door that would allow you to enter this structure. Quite fantastic. And that door and the person is in the center of the frame in terms of the vertical dimension. There's very long light uh, shadows. Well, <laughs> okay. There is there's beautiful light and very long shadows, which helps accentuate a lot of the details here. So, coming out at this time of day made it look a lot different than coming out at another time of day. A good choice. He likes to orient himself to the left or the right of subjects sometimes, and I I think that's very clever because that adds some dimensionality and depth depth as well. And in this case, you can tell he probably waited for the person to align just perfectly in the frame. And that makes the person a, a rather powerful force. And the next one taken in Taipei, Taiwan, we have a very technical photo, which I'm quite impressed with. We have a plane flying through the city, uh, probably heading to an airport to land. Now, there's a problem a potential problem that would arise when taking a photo like this. You have a tremendous amount of complexity, a lot of buildings and things and cars and trees and such in the background. It's hard to separate a plane from all of that because a plane generally can, bl I mean, it's made out of metal too, so it tends to blend in with stuff unless the plane is vibrantly yellow. In this case, it's not vibrantly yellow, but he was still able to separate it. The solution to this hierarchy problem here in this case was, for one, we have an, we have an organization of chaos that is created because the plane is bright uh, and white. It's not dark and black. <laughs> uh, like I said, yellow would be better, but this is still good, still clear separation. There's a soft vignette around the outside of the frame which helps some of the clutter on the outside not pronounce itself too much. And also the plane is at a point where there's a break between it and the, the buildings. Uh, there's a corridor between these buildings where a highway runs, and that's where he chose to capture this plane. The prominence of the plane in the shot is important too in terms of its size, and like I said, in terms of its brightness. Uh, if it was... If it was in a darker pocket, if the sun was going behind a cloud, the plane was much darker, it would not have worked. There's also a leading line of the highway that is breaking up these buildings that goes right through the center of the plane, which draws our eye to it. So everything else in the frame is allowed to be complex because of the intentional organization that happened here. We have another uh, photo taken in Tokyo, Japan, once again. More of these lovely pink, I believe, cherry blossom trees. We have a pink-blue contrast happening here between the out-of-focus uh, subframing elements of the flowers and then the blue sky in the background. And then we have, I believe, what is the Tokyo Tower. The one and only Tokyo Tower, where dreams come to die. The tower is directly in the center. It's clearly the subject of the frame. This photo would be much less uh, interesting without the trees f going around the side as a nice subframing element. 
it would have less power, I think. Uh, one thing that I think is interesting is that the tower stops at the top third of the photo. You can tell he's very measured in his compositions. A lot of photographers, I refer to them as taking more organic photos. He's incredibly measured. He's incredibly intentional about exactly where all of the elements line up. And I, that's glorious to me. Now, we have another one taken in Taipei, Taiwan. This one is highly technical and very difficult to pull off. We have, a, our angle is we're standing in the street looking through some buildings. There's a couple of yellow cars, there's a van, DHL van, and then some taxis driving around, some lovely traditional looking buildings. Uh, a clutter of a street scene that would not be that interesting if it were not for a giant plane, the nose of a plane gliding through the background in a glorious manner. This was taken with excellent timing because we only see the front of the plane. So the plane probably would have gone by really quickly. Planes tend to move quite fast when they're in the air. And it would have been hard to capture the plane at just this position. And I'm curious how he even knew that the plane was going to pop out at this time. I feel like this maybe took some patience. Maybe you waited around for a long time, knowing that planes happen to land uh, near here and come b come through this this small gap between buildings. But uh, I don't know if like he heard the plane just hit the burst and shot th like eighty photos and on photo seventy five he got this one. I'm not sure what happened, but it's beautiful. It's well done. Uh, this is an example of the power of compression. The plane looks like it's right on top of everything. This photo would fall apart without the proper separation. If the the wheel of the plane, the landing gear, which is out, was clashing with a building, it probably would have broke the photo. If the nose of the plane, which is just like so close to the building, t like touching the building, if it was to go behind that building, uh, the photo would have been completely lost immediately. This is, this is, um, the decisive moment on display. We have another one taken in Sri Lanka. And we have a beautiful beach scene. We have a palm tree, very curvy palm tree shooting out towards the sea. We have a person on a rope swing hanging from that palm tree. Looks like it was taken perhaps in the morning, I would guess, with the sun rising. The sun We're shooting into the sun, which looks quite... Dark. It's, it's not as bright as the sun can get. I'm very interesting, interested in how he pulled this off the way that he did. The sun is just a little point of light. I'm assuming he bumped up his, his shutter speed like crazy and shot straight into the sun. So the, the tree and the person on the swing is silhouetted. They're in shadow. So we just see their outlines. So we have some interesting alignments happening here in this photo. One being the tree and the sun. So the, tree, the top of the tree is in the center of the frame. The sun is in the center of the frame. The top of the tree is on the top third and the sun is on the bottom third. We have the tree and the rope. The tree is coming in from an angle to the right, a diagonal angle, and the rope is coming in from uh, a diagonal angle to the left with the person hanging from it. We have an alignment between the person and the sun with the person being in horizontal alignment with it. This photo is, I don't know how you make it more perfect, honestly, it's its absolutely terrific. It's one of his greatest photos for sure. Uh, there's a separation of body elements in this photo. And what I mean is the legs of the person, the arms of the person, they all have nice separation. It's not just a, a, a blob of human shapes floating. There's clear understanding of what we're looking at and it's very pleasing the way that everything is is broken apart. Uh, there's a separation between all of the elements in this photo in a way that makes it feel like it really breathes, which is nice because we're looking at a relaxing beach scene. Might be something you want to achieve. Uh, this photo would have felt much different at noon for sure. It's a glorious shot. We have another one taken in Beijing of uh, traditional looking buildings stacked on top of each other in a cityscape environment. 
So probably a longer lens. We're up high, rather high angle. And I just wanted to touch on this photo because it's a great example of how the human element helps immerse us in the greater story of the image. If the this little person that was walking towards the building in the light was not there, this photo would not have as much appeal. But because we see this person and because also the person is so ambiguous, we're able to kind of put ourselves in their shoes and connect on a deeper level. It's a, you know, photography is, has a lot to do with psychology. We have another one taken in Jordan, lovely desert scene. This photo, God, these are getting better and better. Uh, we have a camel crossing a road, like a two lane route go, that goes through the desert. It's right in the middle of the road. The road is going up a hill, acting as a leading line that takes us to the subject, the camel. Our eye glides up to the camel. We're there, and we receive the glory of this photo. It's fantastic. I I wrote in my notes that I won't say leading line because I've said it too much, but there we go. I already said it. Uh, we have... We have some interesting triangular formations happening here with the triangles of the mountains. So we have two on either side because there's there's a lovely mountain formation in the background. What would have been interesting is if the there were two uh, mountain peaks and then one bigger one in the middle. That would have been neat, Jordan. I don't know why you couldn't pull that off. Like what the heck? But um, but yeah, we have some some interesting triangular elements happening and then we sort of if you want to get fancy about it in your head we have an sort of an upside down triangle implied here where the two peaks of the mountain start the the top half of the upside down triangle and then it points down towards the camel this would be a great poster for a movie like a camel's journey to find his uncle camel Okay, we have another one taken in Saudi Arabia in another desert scene, rather different looking desert, some pretty crazy rock formations happening. But once again, we have a subject in the frame that helps us understand scale and also connect us with the the story uh, that the photo is trying to tell on a human level. We have a person and three camels. So we have Rilat's three uh very tiny against these rock formations. If these, if the camels and the person were not there, we would have a very hard time looking at this photo, registering the scale of a scene like this. In the next one taken in Thailand, we have a lovely, rather large river meandering its way through a, a, a jungle forest-esque landscape with beautiful rock formations shooting up everywhere. A glorious Thailandian scene. <laughs> um, the <laughs> I was, there's one point in these videos where I always have to laugh. I'm going to take a sip of water. I try to resist it because you know what? Laughing slowly kills you inside and outside. It's very bad for your, for your circular system and your uh, reciprocity system and your in in genetic system which is the most important of all that's what keeps you from falling over so when I laugh I understand it you know sometimes you just have to laugh it has to be a release but generally speaking I try not to because I I like to live you know longer than uh, anybody you know, if I'm if I can't hit a good 250, because the reason why everybody dies is because they laugh so much. So, I, you know, I don't want to get too much into that. This video is not about that, but I do want to help some of you out there that laugh all the time. Understand that maybe the best thing you can do for yourself is is be miserable, and you'll live to be 350. That's my goal. So. You know, pray for me. Um, okay, Ta photo taken in Thailand. We have a river meandering through there. Uh, there. The river is quite glorious. And one of the things that makes it feel quite glorious is it seems to go on and on forever into the haze that's in the distance. And this haze is probably has a lot to do with the, with the light in which he shot this photo. Very dramatic, beautiful light. The, the mesmerizing light in this photo is a very strong force for it. 
But once again, the most important thing that I wanted to touch on is we have a tiny, very tiny, but very distinct subject. We have a boat that is coming onto the main river from an offshoot of the river, and we see the trail from that, we, from the boat. We probably wouldn't even see the boat if the trail was not behind it. It's like a comet trail. And uh, so, once again, scale, humanity, and an implied narrative of where this person is going. He's going to take a little journey down the river. It's very pleasing to our minds, naturally. But don't laugh. Uh, so we, and here we see two repeated techniques meaning he repeats this in his work all the time. One is the high up, tilted down angle, right? And then the other one is the tiny subject. And finally, the last photo I want to talk about today is one taken of Mount Fuji from a rather different place than the last photo of Mount Fuji. We are looking at a very serene scene. Mount Fuji, far off in the distance, huge. I... I would love to just go on a Mount Fuji expedition and just make a full make a full orbit around Mount Fuji and see all of the shots I could take with with it in the background. But we have a boat in the foreground, a person uh, rowing said boat, and then nearest to us we have some boats sitting on the shore in a lovely organized pattern, different colors. We have the person, the subject, on the bottom third once again, and then the top of the mountain on the top third. The person is not sitting down in the boat, which I think was very helpful for this. Uh, the the boats coming in on the edges of the frame both poke in on either side in the same way, so it's just the edge of the boat. But, for example, if there was one coming in on the left edge and not on the right edge, it might feel a little bit odd. In this case, there's a there's a mirroring happening. So if you're in a situation like this, it's a good idea to make the edges mirror each other because it will allow you to integrate, uh, allow you to integrate important elements in the scene without having to get rid of them or without having. Let me put it this way: sometimes it's hard to only have one. The, to have two things that are exactly the same on either side. So if you wanted to make this work, what you would do is find something, in this case, is the exact same thing. It's a boat on the either side and make it come in in the same way. But you could also find another element to come in in the same way as the one on the, the left side. Uh, so we have levels of intrigue inserted here, right? If it was just a photo of the mountain, it would be... Great. It's Mount Fuji. Awesome. But if it's a photo of a mountain and somebody in a boat, now you have a fantastic photo. In this case, he took it to the next level. He added a third layer. We have in the foreground boats on the shore, a person on a boat in the water, and then we have the mountain in the background. So in conclusion, when we look at the work of Jordan Hammond, we have a well-rounded travel photographer, like I mentioned. And his photos are rather marketable. Like, I could see this being used in so many different ways that make him money, and I'm happy for him for this, but this style, there's a lot of photography styles that are not as marketable, and I particularly think of the sort of gritty urban exploration or what I like to call suburban exploration where people go out into the more quote-unquote boring parts of town and the suburbs and make it work, right, where you you have a shot from a nice lovely suburban neighborhood, but you decide to put an old water tower in the background to make it more interesting, or it's a shot of a uh, not-so-interesting part of a desert, but there's like a traffic cone sitting there. That that type of work. Harder to market. There, That's a, it's clearly a niche. But in this case, the you know, a photo of a camel in Jordan or any photo of Mount Fuji taken in this lovely polished fashion is a, is a great way, it's a great style to pursue if you want to be able to market your photos to the world, make some money, have some success in that way. But there are a plethora of consistent traits in his work. One being the long lens, one being the distant subject, one being the vertical orientation, one being the subframing elements, one being the high angles, and one being the atmospheric light. We see all of these things consistently. He's been able to repeatedly 
integrate all of these elements into a lot of photographers can maybe pull off one or two of these consistently and you can go a long way with this in this case i mean we have like we have like seven that he that he repeatedly and i think probably intentionally integrates into his shots and um, that's terrific they are technically remarkable photos they are precise and they are elegant good work jordan hammond i enjoy your stuff i would Absolutely encourage you to uh, check out his things. Links below. If you have any photographers that you would like for me to talk about in the future here, please let me know. I would love to. I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you for watching and or listening. Goodbye. Oh, and check me out on Instagram because uh, I haven't pushed that enough. I'm over on Instagram. Very active over there. I'll link below to that too. Goodbye.